This week, in the second of the coronavirus specials, I am joined once again by James Howard Kunstler, who is the author of multiple books, including The Long Emergency and Too Much Magic, both focused on societal collapse. We talk about politics, economics and contemporary culture in relation to the coronavirus. If you wish to support Omidix Podcast, please find our Patreon, merchandise, donation and Kickstarter links in the description below. Enjoy. James Howard Kunstler, thanks very much for coming on to Hermitix once again. A pleasure, James. Despite the, uh, some of the miscommunications we had, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, that was fun. It was all good fun. Uh, yeah. So we are, do you feel vindicated right now from well, uh, what's going on? Uh, I'm certainly not doing any victory laps because this is a pretty sad situation. Um, this uh, set of conditions that I called the long emergency, which mm-hmm. I labeled the long emergency in, mm-hmm. in my own books and in my own argot, um, is uh, pretty grave. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, uh, it wasn't set off the way that I imagined that it would. Although I must say, in my 2005 book titled "The Long Emergency," I had a long and extensive chapter on uh, pandemics and viruses in particular, because um, there was quite a bit of chatter about bird flu at the time I was writing the book. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I did include this as one of the uh, possible triggering events that we would encounter, uh, but. I tend to view the situation as really having two components, you know, the the black swan uh, Wuhan virus event and Mm -hmm. the uh, disruptions that are now uh, setting off terrible disorder in the financial and banking system. And it's been my premise all along that the disorders in banking and finance would really be the decisive factors in creating something like a, you know, a comprehensive political or or comprehensive economic contraction and uh, uh, the ensuing political disorder that would come out of that. Yeah. So when I say vindicate, I don't mean in terms of sort of joyful that, you know, a lot of people are dying. It's not very nice. But I mean, vindicate in terms of this, uh, like you said, has been the the spark which has sort of set fire to the veil of ignorance which everyone has and a lot of people are still adhering to it you know you hear a lot of talk of uh, it'll be back to normal so. yeah yeah well like i said uh, you know not doing a victory lap uh, i will say that my volume of correspondence has gone way up huh. as many people uh, have begun to recognize that this is an extraordinary uh, and uh, hazardous situation for Western civilization, for really for for industrial advanced civilization, and uh, people are recognizing that. And um, I spent about you know ten years since the the crash of two thousand and eight, and the kind of uh, phony baloney uh, financial rescue that attended it. I've been kind of uh, you know cast out into the wilderness of people who should not who should not be paid attention to. And uh, that hurt quite a bit. Um, although, I, you know, I, my career went on. I still made a living, and um, I published several books having nothing to do with, with uh, economic collapse. Um, but, um, I, you know, it, 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 it would be a kind of a pyrrhic victory for me to feel great about it, of course. You understand that. So, yeah, but people are recognizing, if, the, if that's really the main point, are people recognizing that something is up and that this something that's up is pretty serious, a pretty serious threat to the ways of life that they're familiar and accustomed to. Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's happening, and it's a big thing. It's, it's my understanding, though, that the, the cause of the 2008 economic collapse, which was sort mm-hmm. of uh, mortgages wrapped up as... Uh, bad mortgages all wrapped up into a neat little package, roughly, sort of... A yeah, key... but that was, only in a, that was only really one expression of a more generalized depravity in the in the money world in especially in the anglo-american world and and, and the european world of banking so yeah it's true that you know the, that was the trigger the um uh, recklessness in mortgage lending was the trigger but it certainly wasn't the overriding reason for the, the financial collapse which was really due to a great deal of 
uh, simple malfeasance and misfeasance and the lack of accountability for, for people um, behaving badly and uh, not having to pay a price for it for years. So, you know, a v behavior which in a better world would be considered to be unethical, immoral, and, and illegal uh, was allowed to rage on and, in effect, destroy the, the necessary trust that is at the bottom of a financial system. Let's remember, of all the systems that we depend on, and, and there are many of them that are linked to each other, you know, you can, you can state them rather precisely, the agriculture system we depend on for our food, the transportation system we depend on for moving food and goods, um, uh, and, you know, the banking and finance system is another thing we depend on for enabling people to do business. And uh, it became so perverted and distorted that um, uh, the mortgage racket uh, was, uh, you know, allowed to just carry on to such uh, um, to such a, a corrupt extent that it pranged the system. And and of course they they attempted to remedy it by simply throwing money at it, and that seemed to work for a while, but it only really worked in terms of jacking up. Uh, equity markets and bond prices, and that you know there was, I think, a pretty widespread recognition by the bankers and uh, money people themselves that this was hardly a solution to the problem of uh, the deeper problem of uh, misbehavior. You know, I was going to say this. I'm sorry, I got a little off track, but the the reason that the financial and banking system is so vulnerable is because. It's the most abstract system mm -hmm. of all the major mm -hmm. systems we depend on. And one of the most important components of it is trust and faith in the authorities that are conducting these operations. And, and, and especially the trust that they are honest, straightforward, and upright, mm -hmm. and, 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 pl and plain dealing. And when you uh, slide into a, a situation where you are no longer able to believe that that you are uh, uh, getting plain dealing from people and that they are trustworthy, then, you know, money systems and banking systems tend to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I'll end up titling this Coronanomics because um, one thing I've noticed, at least in sort of the very developed Western nations at the moment, they are repeating a strategy which time and time again works in the very, very short term, but doesn't work in the long term, which is, as you say, lobbing more money at things. So in the UK, we've got this 80% wage injection. Uh, in the US, I'm, I haven't kept on top of it, and I'm not sure if it went forward, but Trump's on about, or I don't know if he's already sent out these $1,500 checks to each person. Well, we, we have a mystifying panoply of payments, bailouts, uh, and other transactions that are being conducted by the Federal Reserve, the, you know, the, the central bank of the U.S., mm -hmm. which, by the way, is not a government agency. Uh, it's a um, consortium of banks, of big banks. Um, so this panoply of um, money injections is just sending trillions upon trillions of dollars into the system. And um, uh, I can't imagine that it will do anything but, but ultimately damage the credibility of the system and that whole trust horizon that we just talked about. Uh, in what in what way do you see it clearly damaging it? Um, well, first of all, I don't think that they are going to solve the problem of uh, deflation, which is essentially a problem of loans being uh, going bad. That is not being paid back. Mm -hmm. And you know, you really can't have a credible banking system in which loans are simply not paid back. They're just ignored. You know, the, the whole meta system of bonds and, and really, you know, large scale lending uh, falls apart. There is a hierarchy of lending through the banking system, and it's very complex. You know, it, it runs for, uh, at the highest levels from the various operations of central banks to, you know, the simple um, promissory notes that uh, local people have to give to each other for small business and uh, you know this all, all of these things thunder through the system and eventually they will erode the trust that uh, and faith that these are honest dealings 
and especially the faith in currencies. And when that happens, when faith in currency goes, of course, you know, you've got a real political problem. So, mm -hmm. um, is none none of these uh, none of these money uh, injections are going to change the fact that a lot of obligations will not be met and cannot be met, and that the financial instruments that that represent them, these obligations, you know, the bonds and contracts, uh, et cetera, you know. Uh, th those debts don't go away. They have to work themselves out one way or another, and the eventual workout will be the 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 essential or virtual bankruptcy of the society in one way or another. Now, you know, you can you can go bankrupt by having plenty of money that's worthless, or you can go bankrupt by having no money. You know, those are two monetary manifestations of that. But you can also go bankrupt by having uh, by losing so many of the complex activities of your society that uh, the things that you depend on, the systems you depend on, no longer work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if, uh, uh, if loans keep on going bad and people can't trust uh, other people to pay them for the things they do, they'll stop doing the things that they were doing, with, like delivering food or growing the food or growing the food and delivering it to the supermarkets or running the supermarkets or, you know, whatever this, this matrix of uh, systems that we depend on is, when some of the operations within it stop, then the whole thing kind of gets pranged. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like the uh, when the truck stops scenario, you know, one cog, yeah. one, one cog out of the whole thing. And next thing yeah. you know, you're, you're in a complete drought of food and, well, everything really. Well, for want of a, for want of a, horseshoe nail, you know, and for one of a horseshoe, the war is lost, you know. Um, these things ramify, and, uh, you know, we're talking about interdependent systems that are now being subjected to cascading, uh, ramifying mutual failures. Do you think uh, there's... That's a, that's a mouthful, but there's a lot there. Do you think there's a, a worry of these competitive dynamics which seem to, you know, find their own equilibrium being taken over... Um, and push towards central planning and and centralized. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the attempt to mitigate it. But of course, the more you push it to central planning, the more, the, really, the more distortions and perversions you introduce into the system, mm -hmm. and the more, really, the more fragile you make these. The the worse the fragilities become, and the more inclined the systems are to failure. So, it really is an exercise in futility. I think what I'm really saying, James, is that. The need here for these societies is to have to endure some kind of an honest, straight-up bankruptcy of many of its parts. You know, banks are going to have to go bankrupt, and uh, mm -hmm. companies companies are going to have to fail, and stocks are going to have to go up in a vapor, and bonds are going to have to be lose their value. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things have to happen, and if you don't allow them to happen you will not return to anything like uh, an advanced uh, uh, banking and financial system. And, you know, you'll really be back in a medieval kind of situation where uh, the only things that you can attach value to are, you know, physical objects like gold and silver or, you know, the cargoes of ships and the other things that uh, represented and were traded as as wealth, you know, bills of lading. These were all things from like the 1500s, but they were at least real. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're starting to talk when you talk about credit default swaps and and you know all kinds of arcane and abstruse uh, obligations and contracts between these big banks, they they are really uh, uh, flying flying in, up their own behinds into a into a black hole yeah we had we had a clear example of this uh in the uk they moved um it was over a billion or million however you know at, at that point it doesn't matter but it was the debt the nhs had they moved it from the from it being a private debt and then just moved it into the the public debt so it'll be paid off via taxes and basically it was like a step too far in revealing the abstraction of it all um, yes. and, and it sort of revealed, you know, there's a slogan at the moment from the UK government. It doesn't say to sort of protect our health. It says protect the NHS, which is sort of like extremely revealing in terms of what their primary 
sort of focus is. You know, protect the service and not so much the actual service itself and what it's doing. Protect yes. the sort of institution. Um, yeah. Well, you know, there there's a kind of um, principle involved, uh, uh, maybe in a sideways way. Uh, you know, it's the it's there. There's a version of the Pareto principle, and it's named after um, an economist whose name I forget right now. But the Pareto principle is the eighty twenty principle that you know, um, in in any important system, twenty percent of the people do the important stuff, and eighty percent of the other people just go along. Mm -hmm. Well, in this particular rule, um, twenty percent of the people actually attend to the real job of the institution and 80% hmm. of it just tend to the the ongoing um, momentum of the upkeep of the institution itself so that it doesn't collapse so you know more and more of the resources are going to just support the institution's existence and and only a small percentage of it goes to actually discharging its duties yeah so it's sort of we you know there will be arguments that they still need uh I don't know, diversity monitors and uh, people along those lines. Oh, yeah. Who are, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that 80%. Uh, yeah. um, so you're you're in New York, aren't you? I'm in what you folks call upper state New York. Upper we call it upstate New, New York. How? I'm about, oh, sorry. I'm about 200 miles north of New York City. I'm about 200 miles south of Montreal mm -hmm. and equally from Boston, west of Boston. I'm about 10 miles from the Vermont state border, and I'm near the Hudson River, the Upper Hudson River estuary, and um, I'm in an old factory village of about 2,500 people. Mm -hmm. Used to have about seven factories, and they're all gone. And uh, you know, there's uh, this is what's uh, known as a flyover corner of America, mm -hmm. where there's very little um, industrial activity left. And most of the jobs that are the few jobs that are here are, you know, kind of low wage service jobs. And uh, it, it's a kind of a painful thing to have watched over the years. I know that feeling. I come from uh, sort of a UK equivalent of that. And you, your town eventually just turns from sort of a relatively idyllic, traditional place of uh, authenticity to just a suburban nightmare very, very quickly. Um, yeah. Well, we're not suburban. I must say that that we we are too far from any metro area. The the closest metro area, the closest metro area here is the state capital of New York, Albany, and it's a metro area of about a million people. But we're a good forty five miles away from that. So um, there is very little suburban uh, stuff just around town. We're also fifteen miles east of Saratoga Springs, New York, which is a a venerable old resort town, which up until fairly recently had one of the few um, kind of healthy small town economies in in uh, the state, but uh, I believe it will also be hammered by the conditions that have gotten underway. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what's it what's it looking like there for you, sort of culturally, in terms of uh, Corona and the ongoing uh, chaos? Well. Uh, you know, I'll give you the, the personal uh, angle for me. You know, I, I'm self-employed, so I don't see people at the office every day. Mm -hmm. So I work alone. You know, I'm a writer, and, a, and I work by myself. I'm not going to the office. That hasn't changed my life very much. But um, a lot of my uh, social network was based on playing music with other people three times a week. On Tuesday, I played in what's called a contradance band, uh, you know, basically a string fiddle band. Mm -hmm. um, uh, doing Celtic and English and, and uh, uh, Cape Breton fiddle tunes. And on Wednesday nights, I was playing rock and roll with four of my friends. And on Thursday nights, I was playing in a Celtic jam band in a pub in the next town over. And I got tremendous uh, social satisfaction from those activities, and now they're all suspended. So <laughs> I've gone back to... Um, my piano study of 25 years ago and you know resumed reading um sheet music just for just to get my my brain going mm -hmm. and um you know i have to play uh rock and roll by myself for a while oh, i see now that that's only one component of the scene you know i mean nobody's seeing anybody uh, i'm sh i imagine that that's uh, not too much different from where you are no no um and um 
uh, you know, it's really like living in a zombie society all of a sudden. The other thing about my situation is that I, I, I made the choice uh, seven, eight years ago to buy a property that was a, a three-acre kind of homestead, which I developed uh, into a, you know, a little agricultural spread. So mm -hmm. I've got some significant gardens, and, and I've got a lot of fruit trees and berry bushes, and I've got chickens. So I've got a lot to attend to here. So it's not as though I'm bored. Yeah, I'm in relatively the same situation. My my sort of, you know, uh, reflex of horror begins when I think about spending this time in a flat uh, with sort of three or four other you people. You bet. That's when I you start thinking, you know what? I'm so glad I don't live in a city right now. Um, so has it, has this all gone as you imagined? Do you think, do you think the government's response has been... I mean, to me, I'm surprised. It seems f relatively competent for the government we have. Well, you can have, uh, you know, relative competence and the appearance of competence and still things can go badly. And uh, I, I think they're going badly because really the macro trend was uh, for, for advanced industrial civilizations to have to uh, take a time out and a reset and... And it was, I think that it was always destined to be a considerable and serious reset. Uh, we were, I think, bound for a serious contraction. And a lot of it is really tied up with the basic fact that uh, uh, advanced industrial societies and economies as we know them are really utterly dependent on the cheap fossil fuels that we've been enjoying for 200 years. And... The fuels, uh, the gasoline, excuse me, the, the petroleum and the coal uh, and the natural gas hasn't disappeared. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the quality of it has uh, lessened mm -hmm. and it's become more ex expensive to extract from the ground. And there's, there's literally a kind of equation involving what's called the energy cost of, of energy, which basically states you know, when you get to a certain cost of getting the energy out of the ground, our societies, as they're engineered to run, stop running. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, it's somewhere around um, 17 to 1, meaning, I'll try to explain, that um, at, at its optimum, the advanced industrial economies were working really well when you got 100 barrels of, of oil out of the ground for every oil barrel equivalent you paid to get it out. Mm -hmm. So the 100 to 1 uh, ratio really worked well in the 1950s and the 60s, you know, to, uh, to make those systems work. But ever since then, especially after conventional oil peaked in the United States, those ratios have been tending downwards slowly and steadily mm -hmm. and corrosively. But, you know, it got to the point early in this millennium where uh, the ratio was no longer 100 to 1. It was more like 17 to 1. Mm -hmm. And it, that was beginning to really make the system wobble. It just didn't work at those ratios. Um, we attempted, uh, and by the way, uh, the manifestation of that in the first decade of the millennium led, I believe, to the, the instabilities which contributed to the crash of 2008. Remember that in 2008, oil was shooting up to well over $130 a barrel in, in the USA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, I think Brent crude was even more expensive relatively. And that was pranging the uh, banking system then and, and the debt system. Um, then along came the shale oil adventure and it was a magnificent stunt but it was, unfortunately, it was a stunt, and it was largely a financial stunt accomplished with um, near zero interest rates. And the whole idea was, you know, you give these shale oil companies enormous amounts of loans to conduct their shale fracking operations, and they do produce a whole lot of oil. The problem is it's never profitable. It's never a profitable venture. These companies, you know, well over probably 80% of these companies didn't make a red cent uh, fracking sh and producing shale oil and doing all the other expensive and complex operations that 
that uh, were entailed by it, including, you know, driving thousands upon thousands of truckloads of of uh, water and sand uh, to these fracking operations in the desert in um, Texas, and uh, you know, and the arid parts of North Dakota. So that whole thing has been, in a word, a kind of a fraud. Uh, there's no question that it produced a monumental amount of oil in a very short period of time. You know, we went from the very dangerous situ situation in the U.S. of being down to about uh, under 5 million barrels a day of production while we used 20 million barrels a day. Mm -hmm. uh, we went from uh, under 5 million to now producing just about 13 million barrel barrels a day at the end of 2019. But now that the um, uh, whole investment picture and the, the uh, stock markets and bond markets are getting into trouble, um, the flow of new loans to the frackers has stopped. And, and remember also an important point that they have spent 10 years proving that they can't make money doing this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's a huge disincentive for um, investors to get into shale oil. And let's remember also, they were attracted to shale oil initially because the yields of the, uh, the, the securities that they were used to getting for, to run, for example, insurance companies and pension funds, you know, which, which needed reliable low-risk uh, 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 yield, as it's called, you know, interest. Yeah. Those conditions went away in the, in the new regime of near-zero interest rates. So they were desperate to find some kind of a revenue source that could, could keep their institutions afloat, you know, namely the pension funds and the insurance companies, and, and to some extent the banks. And they were all intertwined. So they turned to shale oil as a, you know, a kind of a savior for, for their activities. But you know, the, uh, it's proven that it doesn't make money. And so the whole thing is a fiasco. What it says in the macro sense, in the big picture, is that this was the shale oil phenomena was something that went up very swiftly over a 10-year period um, and produced a tremendous result over a 10-year period and is liable to collapse e equally or more swiftly than it rose. So that's the short answer to it. And then we're going to be back in a situation where we're back to the pretty much the conventional oil that uh, is dwindling. And, and I think that underlying... So many of the banking and finance uh, uh, disorders of of the now is this this deep deep apprehension that our en energy supply really is uh, at a risk and that it's not going to be the way it was before and that big changes uh, have to happen and the big changes that have to happen are pretty um, obvious and clear we have to decomplexify our activities. And we have to relocalize many of our activities, and we have to um, get smaller, finer, and um, uh, that's really the trend, the macro trend that's underway. And we're resisting it all we can, you know, with all our might, just to support the status quo that's now crumbling around the margins. Let me just play devil's advocate uh, of an optimist for a second. Now, I'm definitely not an optimist, but. The, the the glass half full people would say that this isn't a question of limitation. This is a question of of innovation. Of saying that if if our society is running off um, the fossil fuels and and this limited resource, then the question isn't to continuously find more of this resource. It's to develop an alternative. Now, I don't know if you think that's possible, but but is is it a question of like intelligence and compression in terms of the time? we have to be able to do that while there are still means to do that is running out. Well, um, yeah, th th there are several things going on there. Uh, yeah, the time is running out for that uh, innovative rescue remedy that you are referencing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it, it would have to have happen awfully quickly. And it would really, when you really get down to it, it, it would have to include the the discovery of whole new energy sources and systems that for the present simply don't exist and, and uh, you know have have simply not been invented or discovered and that's pretty unlikely you know at the margins of that um, folder of things there are things like 
uh, cold fusion. But, you know, th that has that has not been demonstrated to be viable. You know, thorium reactors have not been demonstrated to be viable. Um, nuclear uh, energy works for sure. But uh, one of the phenomena uh, that we're seeing is the disappearance of capital. Uh, you know that's what's going up in a vapor in a in a massive deflation, and um, uh, my guess is that we're not going to have the capital to do uh, a whole lot more nuclear, whether we want to or not. And that doesn't include the hazards entailed in in nuclear energy, which are well known and and pretty uh, pretty deep. Um, so I don't think that that's really going to happen. Uh, um, in one other uh, uh, area of this is the idea that we're going to run everything on solar and wind and other things that we already know how to do. I maintain that those things really can't, those industries really can't operate at the scale that we wish them to without an underlying support platform of fossil fuels to enable us to fabricate the hardware for the turbines and the solar panels and the maintenance too, which, uh, which actually require you know, uh, an equal amount of uh, a fossil fuel support. So uh, I wrote a couple of books about this, and, you know, I wrote a book in 2012 called uh, Too Much Magic, which is basically a critique of um, the, uh, uh, the so-called optimist story. And the subtitle was uh, Technology, Wishful Thinking, and the Fate of the Nation. And I was referring to my nation, of course, <laughs> but it, it applies to other nations. And um, I, I maintain that, you know, we had entered a period of, of kind of uh, intense wishful thinking because we were watching our own system get into trouble. And, and we had this, to get into another angle of what you said, um, we have this deep religious belief in innovation and in the power of human intelligence, which is considerable, of course, but based on the more or less recent experience of the human race having um, uh, gained access to various uh, energy streams over the last uh, thousand years you know we we discovered coal and uh, you know we made we made that work for a couple of centuries and uh, we discovered oil and that was uh, even afforded many improvements over coal and there is the, and then we discovered nuclear in the 20th century, and there's a natural inclination to believe that there's an endless succession of rescue remedies uh, for our energy quandary. But I, I simply don't uh, think that it's necessarily true. It's basically a religious faith that there is some next thing. Um, I have to entertain the the probability. That there is not a next thing, and in fact, what we're what we're going to see is we're going to have to apply all of that innovative intelligence to a reset and a contraction, and find ways, clever ways to live in a contracted economy that will have some features of modernity, and in which many other features of modernity will probably be lost. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the next thing. I'm just going to drag it back to Corona here, um, talking about a post-Corona financial situation. And in your recent, you wrote a recent small piece for Zero Hedge uh, about Corona. And well, I, I don't write for Zero Hedge. I just want to correct the record. They they just snatch my blog every Monday and Friday. Oh, okay. Publish okay. It. And they don't even pay me for it. But that's how that works. Uh, you know, I, I'd encourage people to read it on my website for, simply because the Zero Hedge. Um, uh, advertising pop-up layout is so distracting and, huh. and makes it so hard to read. Um, but it, in it, you say, for some, it may be time to lubricate the guillotines. And you're referring to the fact that uh, the American healthcare system, after, the, well, generally, but after the coronavirus, you're going to have all these, uh, I think I saw this morning the statistics for the corona patients that are in hospital. It's, it's over 100,000, definitely. I think it's 130,000 roughly at the moment, probably 140 or 50 now um but these are all people who on your average stay day one day stay in a hospital are going to be billed around if i'm right in thinking between 10 and thirty thousand dollars oh no i'd say way way up are you kidding? really 
for oh, what for oh, one for what for a one day stay well, in the hospital yeah well yeah in the same essay i actually wrote that when i went in for a hip replacement um it's five years ago i was in the hospital for 36 hours yeah and i got a line item bill in the insurance statement that said room and board 36 hours st peter's hospital twenty three thousand dollars and i was not even in a special unit i was just in a bed getting four lousy meals mm -hmm. and having a, a few meds distributed to me yeah. and i involved no sophisticated equipment beyond. and this is apart from the surgeon the surgeon's fee and the anesthesiologist and all those other um uh costs right yeah. do you mind if do you mind if i ask did you did you have the insurance or do you have to pay that back i did so, at the time yeah, yeah. Did, at the time i i i did and and um you know i've i've moved on because i was you know i was under a certain age then i've moved on into the u.s medicare system which is a kind of a half-assed national health system for older people in america yeah. but um uh, at the time i just had a norm a normal blue shield insurance policy mm -hmm. and uh, yeah they they paid out a great deal i had a i had a substantial copay you know my, um I probably paid out of hand something like uh, $8,000 when all of a sudden. Wow. Wow. So you think, so you were in a fairly fortuitous situation when, when that happened to you. So you think, yeah, I you know, protected I... myself, I, you know, I had a, I had a decent health insurance policy at the time, yeah. but, but, you know, since then, and especially with the arrival of Obamacare, which, which did a great deal to further distort and, and pervert the U S healthcare system. You know, it's much worse. So, you know, uh, these people are going to, these people who survive coronavirus, when they get their statements, they're going to wish that they died. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the potential or at this point predicted probably millions of people, we're talking sort of billions pounds worth of debt uh, yeah. generally. Uh, and this is more than likely going to be statistically speaking coming from so the people the people in the poorest backgrounds are once again going to get the, the raw deal here yeah, uh, yeah. and and also you know the the american healthcare system has become so atrocious and cruel and uh uh visibly dishonest that uh it's not going to survive now my own guess is we are not going to be able to reform it for two reasons one is we'll never I don't think that we will achieve the political agreement necessary to make that happen. But secondarily, even if we did, uh, as I stated five minutes ago, I don't think the capital will be there. You know, the capital is now vanishing uh, in uh, massively and, and rapidly, and the capital is not going to be there. So I think what will happen in reality is this. The medical system in the U.S. will do what every other system has to do. It will decomplexify. It will have to get a lot smaller. Um, it will have to become much more local. And if it can emergently reorganize itself or self-reorganize, shall we say, uh, I think it will be at a kind of a local clinic level, uh, maybe a little bit better than what you get in some third world countries now. Mm -hmm. And that there will be very little really, you know, super advanced, uh, high cost medicine of the kind that we're, that we've, uh, luxuriated in. And I think that's just the way it's going to be. I think it will be more face to face and, and one to one and honest and straightforward, mm -hmm. but it will depend an awful lot on people keeping themselves healthy. Who do you think's at fault in terms of the, the fact that your, your healthcare system is such, such a sort of racket? Well, um, there are many, many agents in the uh, picture who behave badly. You know, the, the insurance companies uh, were uh, terrible racketeers. The hospital systems, which became, you know, major uh, acquisitive corporations that took over small, small hospitals and, and became bigger and bigger organisms, you know, corporate organisms that paid their executives in the C-suites, you know, making, you know, $20 million a year to be the chief financial financial officer of some, you know, giant healthcare system that, that owned 13 hospitals. You know, th these were obscene uh, salaries and, and bonuses and fees that were paid to these people. 
it, it just became an extractive operation. The doctors themselves, uh, especially um, in the 1970s and 80s, as they became accustomed to having become a super finan financial el or vocational elite, let's say they were in a, you know, they were a super vocational elite, and they got used to having, uh, you know, very large houses and driving very expensive German cars, and enjoying uh, sending their children to Ivy League colleges, and they they enjoyed tremendous perks. Uh, they have actually suffered some in the last ten years, uh, especially since Obamacare, but. Um, their greed has been part of the picture. And, uh, you know, another part of the picture is the kind of mm, uh, overweening American stupidity around the idea that everybody should be allowed to get something for nothing. And, uh, you know, that has led to a lot of bad decisions mm -hmm. uh, about how we uh, do, the, do these things. So, you know, the whole thing, has, it has become wholly dishonest and racketeering in the strict sense of the term, is about getting money dishonestly. You know, that's the basic idea of it. And racketeering has come to permeate American business. And most unfortunately, it, it's, it's overtaken these two enterprises that you'd think would have to be the most resistant to racketeering. First, medicine, which is based on the uh, uh, idea that you should first do no harm. And secondly, education which uh, is based uh, on seeking the truth. Both of them have become exuberantly dishonest um, fields of, of human endeavor. Mm -hmm. you, me you mentioned the, the, the idea, the, the sort of underlying privileged idea that uh, everyone should get something for nothing. This, this prevailing idea, uh, specifically of Western, it's, it's very prevalent in the UK now, but you, you mentioned of the US. Uh, and it sort of ties in with a question I've got here, which is one of the f my favorite things that you comes across in your writing, which is sort of the younger generations. And I mean, I hope you won't take it the wrong way when I say that you are sort of a grumpy old man figure uh, who's wagging his finger at millennials often. I actually don't do that that much. No? I, 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 no, I, I, okay. I really don't. I haven't been twanging on them. Um, I, I mean, I recognize that there are cultural differences between the generations, um, but I actually feel kind of bad about them. I, um, if anything, you know, I have been, it's true that I have been twanging on the wokester phenomenon of, you know, woke politics and identity politics and racial politics, especially in the U.S. Well, you, you've got plenty of it in the U.K. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you yeah. know, in fact, um, arguably, your behavior around those things has maybe even been worse than ours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but I, that's the part that I'm against. Uh, I have a great deal of sympathy for their economic plight, though. Mm -hmm. well, you know, the fact that they're not going to be able to live at nearly the level of comfort and convenience that my, my generation did. Well, it's one of the things we mentioned last time. You said that, it, that um, young people would find the idea so abhorrent that they might have to work on a farm or doing some form of kind of... Um, I don't know, I mean this in an offensive way, but common labor, you know. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned that sort of agribiz is pretty much over. And we, there's going to be a pretty sort of cutthroat reversion here back to potentially even horses and oxen. And that transition period to me, which is going to be a year long process, you know, collapse is a slow thing. Oh, I think it'll be more than a year long process. No, no, year, years long, it's years a, long. Yeah, it is underway, you know. The, yeah. And, and a lot of it is. A lot of it is due to the financial problems. But I think this transition period really brings to light what the, let's say, sort of cultural and assumed mental character characteristics of things are like. Because the transition yeah. period really is from one of assumed comfort. You know, our current level of normality and normalcy is taken not as sort of a privilege. The fact that water comes out of a tap and it's clean and you can drink it and you can have as much as you want on a daily basis isn't a uh, daily basis isn't taken as um a privileged thing a real anomaly of history it's taken mm -hmm. as fact you know that's how it is and it seems to me the transition period is one from sort of uh a very ideal anomaly in in human history back to what is actually normalcy yes yeah and 
you know, oddly enough, I'm, I'll introduce a, a perhaps strange note into this. You know, one of the things that's been characteristic of the younger generations is the obliteration of uh, boundaries, especially gender boundaries, and especially gender boundaries as applied to the divisions of labor. Mm -hmm. And and one of the uh, consequences of this has really been to devalue the idea of manhood. And uh, like it or not, uh, the the generations coming up are going to have to man up because we're going to we're going to be facing some very difficult challenges, and uh, you know softies are not going to do well in that situation. <laughs> uh, it's, I couldn't put it more simply. You know uh, the ideologies that developed around that. You know they were they happened, they were unfortunate, they were what they were, but uh, I think the the straight up truth about it is that's over. Yeah. Um, and what do you think will be what comes of that? You know, who's well, who the losers in that situation? What's going to happen to them? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, um, it's painful to say because it's somewhat self-evident that, um, you know, the losers are going to fall by the wayside and simply not thrive. And of course, you know, the way to not thrive in the most extreme sense means that you die. Um, but there are different degrees of not thriving, of course. And then there will be people who recognize that, you know, they've got a hard, a hard road to hoe and a hard job ahead, and they've got to, um, you know, they've got to deal with it forcefully. Now, I think in terms of social organization, you know, I, I wrote these four novels after I wrote The Lung Emergency. I wrote four novels under the rubric title world made by hand mm -hmm. and I depicted a post economic collapse world in America uh, centered around a small town like mine and uh, what was happening in the in my imagination in this world that I depicted was that um, a kind of neo medievalism was reestablishing itself and or neo feudalism really and what that meant in simple terms was social uh, relations were becoming far more explicitly hierarchical. Mm -hmm. That uh, the people who controlled good land and 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 were intelligent about farming it well and and um, uh, producing things of value, you know, these were the people who would would uh, become the uh, upper classes, you know, unlike the bankers and hedge funders of today, and that many people would more or less have to uh, pledge their their allegiance to these people in order to find a, a niche uh, to to work and live and a structure for their lives. So, for example, one of the characters in my World Made by Hand novels is uh, a man named Stephen Bullock, who... Uh, who has been, uh, you know, he's he's a guy who has seen what was on the horizon before the crash, and um, he has been buying up all his, the adjoining farms that are failing as the crash occurs, and so he now has, you know, thousands and thousands of acres, which in in America, in the East anyway, is fairly rare, and he's attracted all these people to live on his property in a village that he's constructed for them, which is essentially, you know, a peasant village. And they're working for him in the fields and the orchards and, and the um, value-added operations that he's doing, his dairies and his distilleries and things. And uh, so he's really become, in effect, a, a, a neo-feudal lord. And, you know, to me it was a point of humor that any time anybody actually pointed that out to him, he took great offense at it, you know, because he, he retained, he still retained all these old American egalitarian <laughs> ideas about society. But in effect, that's what happened. I, I think that that's liable to happen. I think a lot of the egalitarianism of the late 20th century and early millenn new millennium are going to fade away rather quickly as we rediscover that human beings are hierarchical social animals. Mm -hmm. And the, hi the hierarchies will be uh, more, di more distributed uh, at a finer grain, meaning you, know, you will see local... Uh, hierarchies rather than just you know the federal government and and the central banks and and the JP Morgans uh, lording it over everybody else well this is one of the the big things which politically corona has, has caused which is a complete uh, disintegration of the idealism of globalism 
you know. So it seems to me the things that I can predict here is a rise in nationalism, but it's not really a idyllic nationalism. It's more to do with the location and keeping people away from a certain location. Uh, yeah. There's a distrust of governments coming, a heightened sense of personal sovereignty for a certain select of individuals who are at least still not clinging to what that was. I mean, there's going to be people who will always cling to it and just say that the slump is an anomaly. But this, you know, I'm in agreement here that what's coming is borders. You know, that's what we're talking about here is people bordering off and saying, yes. no, 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 yeah, here's, here's resources, they're ours. Um, but I think before that happens at a local level, nationalism, and I think any smart right winger in in uh, quotation marks there because what does that mean anymore uh, but any smart right winger would you know this is an opportunity for you know, well for whatever you really want you know people need guidance right now like you said with the neo-feudalism thing if someone jumps in and steps up to the plate uh, then it's it's prime time and it might be the the point you know, we were talking last time and you said that uh, we haven't seen anything on the right like we have on the left yet. And this seems to be the 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 boiling pot for that to come about. We just need the we need the charismatic figure, really. Well, there there is that. I will grant you that. And there, I think there will be plenty of room for charismatic figures, you know, uh, good and bad to rise up. But, you know, there's a, there's another dynamic that is preceding that. Uh, First of all, I'd have to say as a basic understanding for me, uh, and I wrote this in, in several of my books, that you know one of the features of the coming disposition of things would be that uh, anything organized at a giant scale would tend to fail, whether it's a corporation or a national government or what, whatever, you know, a giant university. All these giant things are going to fail. So underlying anything I say you know, from here on is, is my belief that um, the the national governments are going to behave fecklessly in the face of this, whatever they do. And and the um, what's happening in the U.S. I think is that the pro so-called progressive left-wing, you know, Democratic Party faction in America is proffering the idea that they can apply all of these old kind of neo-Marxist ideas to rescuing the economy and the status quo and and you know that includes you know the na a nationalized uh, single-payer health service and a guaranteed basic income and all of these features of American uh, leftist ideology mm -hmm. but um, if they do succeed in winning the next election or gaining power um, I think they will only succeed in demonstrating how incompetent uh, national governments will be and how easily they'll fail because their policies will fail. They won't work um, because the capital's not there and the energy's not there. So uh, ultimately, you know, uh, also, you know, I, I view this current situation in the U.S. as being a little bit analogous to the Jacobins at, at that, that stage of the French Revolution, which is about 1793. And the Jacobins were this faction in the National Assembly who were the equivalent of uh, Marxist extremists of our time. And they, they wanted desperately to completely remake French culture. You know, they got rid of the normal calendar and replaced it with their own calendar. They decided that the week would have 10 days instead of seven. Uh, they got rid of the church and replaced it with uh, the new religion of the so-called supreme being with all of its new holidays. They got rid of all the old Christian holidays. And they were well underway with this program. Uh, and after a year of this, the other people in France just rose up against them and chopped their heads off. <laughs> and by the way, in the process of instituting this, this enormous uh, reform uh, of theirs, the Jacobins uh, guillotined about 18,000 of their fellow countrymen. And, and that, of course, was one of the things that really appalled everybody else in France. So when the time came, Robespierre and his, uh, his lieutenant, Saint-Just, were sent to the guillotine. The interesting thing about the fall of the Jacobins was once, they, once the leaders were out of the picture, once Robespierre and Saint-Just were dead, you, you never heard of them again or their program. They were just swept away like overnight, like... No, we're not going to have this bullshit. 
you know <laughs> that was insane and and we're totally dropping it and, and we're gonna you know do something else excuse me and then you know within just a few years uh napoleon bonaparte comes along this uh 27 year old artillery officer and demonstrates that he's uh uh you know got some some stones hmm. and everybody turns to him and says oh yeah this is the guy we want we want this guy to run the country and there you have it you know do you, i don't think that's a reaction from the crowd that's regarding any coherence though i think that's more regarding someone who is confident and competent enough to uh, to lead a crowd. You know, we don't have absolutely. much. Of, you know, absolutely. The um, theater, the show. Uh, yeah. Being, yeah. And if anything, if anything is going on in our cultures, you know, there there, there is a complete absence of faith in in uh, the competence of leadership and a complete absence of charisma. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. You know, Donald Trump it may be considered charismatic to many people. Um, you know, I, I I suppose I should make my political um, position about him clear. Um, I didn't vote for the guy. Um, I'm not a cheerleader for Trump. But my basic position is I think that his adversaries on the left have behaved much more badly than he has. And so I'm very exercised about that. And I think that they are examples of people who did things that were very bad that need to be punished, you know, the spying on presidential candidates and creating hysterias over Russia and, you know, all of that uh, uh, FBI, CIA nonsense that was going on. Um, so I'm much more exercised about those breaches in, in our constitutional duties than I am about Trump, Trump's uh, incoherence and, and um, vulgar, vulgarity, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So there's an absence of char charismatic leadership. And, uh, you know, charisma at its base is, is the idea that somebody really knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of a declension of, of, of charisma, which goes from people who really know who they're doing to people who seem to know who they're doing, to people who are obviously pretending to know what they're doing, to the vast numbers of people who have no idea what they're <laughs> doing. And, um, uh, but right now we have few figures on the scene in the USA who seem to know what they're doing. Uh, I don't, I, I'm curious what you think about Bojo, because in some ways he's a Trump-like Trump figure, but in other ways, you know, he's such an obviously brilliant guy. You know, I saw this. This might be a, just a, uh, a a sheerly British university stunt. I don't know because we don't have this kind of thing in the states. But I saw him do this thing on a television show where he literally recited uh, the Iliad yeah, in yeah. in ancient Greek. It's probably a well-known stunt over there, but it was kind of an awesome intellectual feat. No, but I mean, this uh, that's it's not too common. It's common on the conservative right in the UK. I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg as well is someone who uh, classically educated, and there's a lot of that with them. But Boris Johnson, generally the UK um, reaction to him that I've seen, even from people who are apolitical, even some left-wingers, is that he he's doing very well. It's extremely competent, extremely clear. Um, I think he does know what he's doing, and we can see that from how he handled the election, which it was after Brexit, instead of focusing on the areas that he's already won, he went straight to the working class heartland and won over so many Labour seats in a short amount of time. And, yeah. you know, and Labour, of course, focused on the liberal areas of London like they always do. And, of course, they lost and it was an absolute landslide. Um, I do think he does know what he's doing, but also his advisor, Dominic Cummings, uh, he he really knows his stuff. Uh, and that's clear. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I think... It's interesting. But... Yeah, and I don't think that Mr. Trump enjoys the nearly the same level of respect, um, uh, really. You know, and we also we have this problem. Well, you've got it. You've got the same thing in the in Great Britain. You know that the intellectual class, the thinking classes of both of our countries, have become so infected with idiocy that it, it's just an astonishing uh, <laughs> uh, phenomenon. Yeah, I mean. I... And you have to depend on the thinking classes in your in, in advanced societies. And, you know, when they go 
when they go awry, you've got a terrible problem. So, you know, we've got all these people in America, in, in the American journal journalism uh, field and in the universities and the thinking class generally, who are preoccupied with these nonsensical ideas about identity politics, and it's yeah. occupying, you know, <laughs> most of their brain space. And it's completely, uh, it's a complete waste of time, and, and most of it involves one kind of falsehood or other. Yeah. So we no longer you know, we no longer have a thinking class which is accessible to the average person. It's sort of like um, yeah. Plato's Republic gone bad. You know, the philosopher king which no one can understand. Um, and I think. Well, I think the reason for that. I'm sorry to interrupt you, okay, but I okay. think the reason for that is actually that it, it's not about the quality of thinking. It's about scoring brownie points mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. for virtue signaling and for you know for status seeking. The status seeking on the basis of uh, virtue has become so intense that it's eclipsed all other intellectual activities in the thinking classes. Yeah, but that will be one of the first things to go, as far as I can see. I mean, they're, cling they're clinging on, but it's, you know, between eating and uh, writing some accessible paper on something, you know, we all know where we stand, whether or not we, well, want, let me whether or not we want to admit it. Um, just in the last uh, four weeks, for example, in your country, um, hasn't the uh, hasn't all the blabbery and and activity around political correctness and and um, identity politics come to seem utterly absurd in the face of the other things that are going on? Oh yeah, but I mean I, I mean uh, is your you, as as much as I want to sort of talk about that question, I think it would be wrong for me to answer it because I'm already on the side of. St being able to see through that as, as idiocy in my own opinion. So, but I am seeing more people who are getting frustrated when it's mentioned. Um, you know, that shouldn't be taking up any time at the moment, you know, and that yeah. that's, um, especially when the statistics regarding coronavirus are the ones they don't want to hear, you know, 80% male, uh, fatality victims, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things along these lines. Um, so yeah, but you, you talk about the absence of charisma and you mentioned in the, in your recent post, there's an absence of something else, which is, you know, if you look at history after events such as these, and I mean, a common one is after World War II, there was actually a culture of generosity and, and charitable natures and sort of localized giving. Uh, yes. And one of the things you, you mentioned is that one of the, and one of the things that sort of globalized um, homogenous culture does is just atomize you and make you hostile and selfish. So all that matters is your, the individual and the identity and the status of of that identity the needs of that and you know you, as far as i can see this is something you're saying this has got to change and i think this is probably going to be the most difficult transition is from a complete selfishness which is doesn't even have any it's apolitical it's just pure material selfishness to one wherein you know we're going to have to be charitable again well, uh, the way I see it is that I, I agree with what you said, absolutely. A and it's largely uh, an institution building question. And I, I see that as having a logistical component in the sense that um, we're facing a situation where there will be probably mighty demographic movements. And that includes, you know, an increased number of people leaving uh, struggling poor lands and trying to get into the what were the wealthier lands, that in itself is going to be you know a, a, a big quandary and, and a problem. And um, I mean, it already is in in uh, continental Europe, but the terms of it are, are going to change because you know they're not going to be so welcoming of the next waves of of the newcomers. Um, but in uh, in the USA, for example. Uh, a, a lot of it is going to hinge on the fact that our cities are too large, uh, they're too complex, the uh, financial picture of the future um, suggests that we're not going to be able to maintain them at the current scale, and that a lot of people are going to have to go elsewhere. And that means, you know, they're either going to have to go to the rural places or to the smaller towns. Mm -hmm. The smaller towns in America, uh, and perhaps in Britain too, are the places that have seen the the worst disinvestment and and um, decay? Oh yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah. But in America, these are places that actually have tremendous strength 
for um, uh, for whatever the next economy will be. And I'm thinking especially of the fact that we have, you know, we, we do have a lot of good soil in the interior of America and good farming if it's done in a different way. We have a magnificent inland waterway system that allows us to move goods long distances, um, you know, on the Ohio River and the Mississippi River and the Missouri River and the Hudson River estuary and the Champlain Canal to the St. Lawrence and all that. And um, I think we'll see people leaving the big cities and the parts of the country in the U.S. that really can't support complexity anymore, like, you know, Phoenix and, and, and Southern California. You know, they're going to be looking for a place to go. And the survivors, you know, not everybody's going to get to the places that, that have better prospects. So th there's a whole logistical issue of, you know, there, there will simply be a swirl of movement, of movement as, as people seek to uh, change the physical location of their circumstances so that they can begin to try to attempt to thrive again one way or another. And of course, they'll have to rediscover what the uh, new activities are for them. You know, basically, they will involve making themselves useful to other people in some way or other. And then the next question is, you know, what scale uh, of institutional uh, rebuilding can go on? I don't think it's going to be the big city scale of rebuilding or the massive scale or the national scale. You know, we're going to have to rebuild. Uh, are you still? There? Yeah, yeah. We're going to have to rebuild these institutions on a much finer grain in places that can support a fine grain, where people, more people know each other and, and have transactional relationships on a regular basis. And, you know, that's what the smaller town in America was, was good for. People employed the people who lived around them, their neighbors, uh, even, if they, uh, even if there were hierarchical uh, relations involved. You know, they still knew these people and had to answer to them. Uh, you know, it's funny. I've been just, you know, as it happens, I've been looking at some 1930s movies, uh, American movies lately. And, you know, to see the, the way the difference in, in uh, human relations as expressed in those, uh, you know, 80, 90 year old movies is so stark compared to how we behave today, a, a, a lot of which is reflected in what you said about, you know, the atomized um, uh, individuals scrambling for their own little niche and their own little, you know, whatever wealth there is. So the rebuilding will really have to focus in the places that are scaled appropriately for institution, institutional rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And just to finish up here, like that's, so that's one thing you see coming from this Coronavirus. What do you see in the in the short term, in the near future? You know, things happening, things that we should be prepared for. The thing I would be most concerned about would be civil violence and disorder. You know, right now we're seeing uh, people all over the world in this extraordinary circumstance of absolute, absolutely everybody being cooped up. You know, at home. I mean, we've never seen anything like this in the world. And um, that's weird enough. But um, uh, as the economics of this goes forward, there are going to be a lot of resentful people out there who, who do not like the idea that wealthy classes are being bailed out with free money while they're getting screwed. Mm -hmm. And I think in America, that's going to be the big deal, is that we're going to see the, we're going to finally see the expression of all this. And, you know, there are something like 300 million firearms on the loose in America. <laughs> and, and that's a lot of firepower. And we know from the uh, recent experiences with asymmetrical warfare that you can have a very large, sophisticated army with uh, the most uh, uh, stupendous weaponry, high-tech weaponry. But, you know, if small bands of uh, pissed-off people go up against you, uh, you're going to still have a whole lot of trouble. You can create a whole lot of instability with a very few small arms and a few rockets. <laughs> am I, you know, am I right? Yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, I believe you're working on a new book. Uh, oh no, it's out. It's uh, out. Uh, I am working on a new book, but it's after the one that I have been working on. Yeah, I I wrote a book the last couple of years called "Living in the Long Emergency," which was uh, uh, 
a, an extension of the arguments I was making in the Long Emergency and Too Much Magic books. Mm -hmm. um, this one features a middle part. The heart of the book is a set of interviews with people who are li who are living, shall we say, alternative lives, lifestyles. You know, people who have become homesteaders and uh, farmers, distillers, bakers, um, and and things like that. There's there's a long interview with uh, an American white nationalist. I thought that he should be included because people need to know about what goes through the minds of these people. There's a portrait of uh, a middle-aged black intellectual who lives in the Baltimore black ghetto in rather strange and interesting uh, conditions, and I wrote about him. Uh, many of these people were people who corresponded with with me because of my earlier books, and I got to know them a little, and and um, so they agreed to be depicted in this book. So it's called Living in the Long Emergency from Ben Bella Books, and and uh, I will leave it to your readers to find out how to get it. Okay, thanks very much. If this is there anything you'd uh, you'd like to add, James? Yeah, um, I write a twice weekly blog. Um, can I say the name of it? Oh yeah, can, I'll put it in the, the the link in the description. Yeah. Okay, because it, it's called Clusterfuck Nation, and that's an Amer that's old American military slang for a, a situation that's really you know uh, really bad and has been caused by human idiocy. So uh, my blog is uh, comes up every Monday and every Friday at ten o'clock in the morning Eastern American time. I guess that's about. Uh, uh, that's about mm, three or four o'clock in the afternoon your time, mm -hmm. depending on whether we set our clocks back. And it comes out absolutely regularly. It's uh, usually pretty funny because, as old Samuel Beckett said, nothing is funnier than unhappiness. <laughs> and uh, so that's what I've got on offer here. And uh, I, I hope some of your listeners will read my blog because it's, uh, it's edifying and funny. Okay. James Howard Kunstler, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure gabbing with you.